I wanted to invite you to this very special conversation with Brian. It is a recap of my five previous shows. We're going to have Ann Bailey Lipset and Tracy Hewlin talk about their book on social emotional learning for elementary age students. We're going to have the amazing Katie White, who's going to talk about assessment and self-assessment for, for students in particular. We're going to have Esther Rodriguez Brown, who talks about mudras for your everyday life and her holistic way of healing our, our minds, bodies, and souls. We're going to have Maurice McDavid, a young author, principal, who has written a book about himself, what I always wanted to be. And last but not least, we're going to have Dr. Don Parker, who is an expert on teacher-student relationships, and he'll be talking about his book, Building Bridges. So I hope you join us for a very special A Conversation with Brian. You know, it, it is all about the collaboration and historically schools have um, collaborated around the academic instruction yeah. and haven't always had conversations of, and they might have had conversations about the culture um, and a, a healthy climate, but maybe not about the learning environments. And I always say, yeah. you know, a, a preschool or kindergarten learning environments can look really different than a fifth grade environment. And so sure we're no longer can just focus and have our collaborative conversations around academics. It yeah. needs to be around our learning environments, the culture, climate, as well as the instruction for academics and social emotional learning. And I think the other piece that, um, and you just, it just made me think about you know, what you just said is when we focused on the academics, um, we focused on identifying essential academic standards. And, and now we have to really start to identify essential social emotional um, skills that we're going to teach throughout the school. So everybody is we're saying, you know, self-awareness, self-management, um, you know, social awareness, these relationship skills, you know, those those pieces we're going to identify and say, OK, how how can we teach these to every single child to make sure that every single child leaves us with these skills? And it can't be, as, as we know with our work at Mason Crest, it can't be top down. It can't just be with one grade level. Um, it, it can't just be with one um, S, SEL team. It has to be school wide. Um, teachers, administrators, school staff has to make those collective commitments to maintaining that positive culture, healthy climate, and those safe environments for our students throughout their day and across multiple school settings. So yeah. we think about how confusing it is for a child to be learning these and then, but their bus driver doesn't maintain them or the oh. bus driver does, but you know, the teacher they go to for their reading group doesn't, it has yeah. different expectations and it's sending all kinds of different messages yeah. to the child along with this, the staff of well, what is expected. Well, again, that, that idea of clarity precedes competence, and we have to be on the same page. All right, so talk to me about these these building blocks, um, because I, I, I love the, 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 the way you've laid them out, um, and I think it makes it very doable, but um, I want to hear from you all. Talk, talk to me about you know what you were thinking when you created these, uh, these building blocks. Sure. So one of the things that there's a, um, like we, when we went over that, massive definition. There's all these different components of what social emotional learning is. They're all, we can isolate them into these little pieces. Yeah. But when we really look at those, those are developmental skills that come over time. They're not something that every kindergartner walks into the building ready to do all of these different pieces. And so when we, we spent a long time looking at the current work in the mental health, the infant parent mental health field, um, and the research that's going on there around the developmental, the human development and bringing in what's already in the field of social emotional learning and putting that together so that we have a much better, that this visual kind of helps us understand like, okay, what do we need as our base? Kind of what do, what do we need? If something isn't working, if the child is having trouble making decisions, well, do we just focus on that decision making or do we need to see what blocks underneath might not be fully there? Yeah. So, and I love it. the way Tracy and I work together was so great because I'll kind of like talk and ramble and she's like, wait a minute, I see it, I see the visual. <laughs> and she would get it down. So I love this visual that she 
she kind of took this idea out and I was like, no, no, it's kind of developmental. And she's like, wait a minute, it's blocks. Um, and it really is kind of like the jing if you, you know, play the game Jenga, yeah. that you can start, you can take out a block or two and it still stands. So you don't recognize it as a tower that's going to fall over, but it's going to be a much shakier tower. Yeah. So when we look at this, this is really to remind us of, well, where is, what do the children, what do students need first? And it might, they might look like they've got it all together, but what else is going on here? What down in that foundation needs to be firm before we can build on top of it? And there seems to be a lot of different versions of, you know, these uh, components um, out there. Why did you all kind of you know, settle on, on this type of framework or the, this visual? I think it really came back to the, that need to be able to show the developmental nature of it. And we'd often find when I'd, I'm in a fellowship for infant parent mental health and the mental health professionals there would say, well, I just want teachers to know this. Why don't they know this? Well, it, when teachers do know it, they'd be like, why didn't anyone tell me this before? Yeah. And when they do get it, and sometimes it is, you know, it's out there. They're like, oh, this works. This makes sense. And so we really just thought, and we struggled with this because what's out there is excellent. Um, but it also doesn't capture that developmental nature that we really need to be able to understand if we're going to support all children. We do share in our book, um, Castle, who we say is the one of the leading um, sources of um, helping schools to embed social emotional learning. They have five competencies and in our book, we, we have a diagram that shows how they're integrated into our building blocks. And um, Stephanie Jones um, is sort of the leader of the East Cell Lab at Harvard. And they talk about six domains that involve cognitive skills, emotional skills, social skills, as well as um, they call them belief ecologies, which I deal with identity, um, perspective and um, values, right? Like our mindsets and we think about um, character building and um, our self-esteem, motivation, gratitude, things of that nature. Um, and so those are also embedded into these building blocks. So we've we've taken ideas from them, but as Ann Bailey mentioned, um, since she's done so much work um, in the mental health field, um, you can see that this is woven in through our building blocks and um, we're excited about that. That's awesome. And I don't... In your in your uh, book, you talk about um, portfolios um, and data notebooks. Can you talk a little bit about you know those two things in relationship to self assessment? Sure. So we don't have to do them. Um, we can engage kids in self assessment based on a single artifact, product, or performance, or whatever, yeah. um, and that's perfectly fine. The advantage of data notebooks and portfolios is it allows us to draw students' attention to longitudinal development. So, in, I mean, I think, I think that there's already um, a bit of a misconception by kids that a, an isolated assessment event is just that, it's isolated. And when I'm done, it's done. So when I'm done this test, I'm done. Right. And when I'm done this, I handed in this assignment, I'm done. And I, I really think it's important to help students walk towards the notion that learning is continuous, that revision is important, reflection is critical. And, and so a portfolio and data notebook allows students to compare artifacts from different time periods, to um, sort of document their learning journey so they can put in their messy thinking and their brainstorming and they can put in drafts and, and then they can think about how they got to that finished product or performance based on decisions they made so that they can repeat those decisions next time. All of that sort of longitudinal, hey, who are you as a learner? What have you learned over the course of time? And the last thing I would say is they allow us to really celebrate. I think, I think both teachers and students lose track yeah. of how much growth happens in a year, but a portfolio or a data notebook makes that extremely visible. So that's important. Thank you. What's what's the teacher's role in um, self assessment in terms of the data notebook, data notebooks, and portfolios? I mean, because you know, if, sometimes teachers will will have these elaborate data notebooks and portfolios, but the kids are just saying, "Well, this my teacher says I'm supposed to do this." So, what what yeah. is the teacher's role? 
It kind of depends on the age of the kids. It kind of depends on, I mean, I, I say as one of the very first things I say in the first chapter is you as a, an educator need to be clear yourself about why you're doing it. Yeah. Um, what are you hoping to accomplish? And if that's not happening, then, then adjust, right? Like, so the role of the teacher though, I think I would caution teachers from curating everything that goes in there. Right. I, I've, I've seen teachers absolutely spend evening after evening uploading student work and photographs and videos. And that's the, that's the teacher's portfolio. That's not the kids. And that can get um, overwhelming. The teacher can say, you know, so I can be right now the teacher would be saying, I can't do this. You know? I can't. Yeah. So if we view portfolios and data notebooks as less of a photo album and more as an evergreen, um, you know, growth, always changing uh -huh. document, yeah. Uh, then we can be less concerned that it looks beautiful and more concerned that kids are heading back into it and making reflections, that they're using it to propel decision making, that they're becoming familiar with success criteria and goals as a result of it. And so I think as I mean, even our littlest people can make decisions. Lots of teachers are using um, apps like Seesaw and things like that, where students can upload things themselves. It's very intuitive. And I just encourage that. Um, so teachers are encouragers. They help kids curate. They set, um, you know, they design reflection questions, analysis prompts. They provide time for students to do that. And then um, here's a really big one. They build into their learning plans recovery time so that when students self-assess, if a student says, I see I need to do this, they aren't out of time. Yeah. then the teacher can say, hey, guess what? Great news. Tomorrow you have 15 minutes to do that. Let's do that. Right. Let's head back into our work or let's apply what we've learned with this work to our next piece. So um, so I think that they're, they have to structure, they have to build in time into their learning program for students to reflect and also recover. And that's huge because if you don't do that, then people say, I don't have enough time. If you don't put it in up front, then you're going to be trying to catch up at the end. And you're saying, you know, when can I fit this in? And so you at the beginning of a unit or be, be yep. the beginning of a cycle of instruction, you're going to say during this period of time, the kids can have time to reflect and, and respond. Yeah, it might be like every Friday for half an hour is reflection time, or it might be at the beginning of every class for the first five minutes, we're going to set intentions. And for the last five minutes, we're going to reflect on whether we met those intentions. It can be um, you know, every two, once every two weeks, we're going to head into our portfolios and look at our progress. So it's, you're right, it has to be built into our unit plans um, as part of an essential sort of set of skills that we're developing. Okay, let's change gears a little bit. Okay. Um, in your final chapter of the book, you discuss privacy, which is really wow. kind of just popped out at me. Um, why do you think this topic is so important and how does it relate to self-assessment? So I feel like I have another book that I need to write about this topic at length. I just touch it, right? And I feel you like it finished, was... You just finished your fourth book. Oh, my gosh. Oh, one book, it just it now. It's okay. wore me out. And you were, you were <laughs> talking about a fifth book. I know, I know. But anyway, I really... this idea of privacy. <laughs> what, what does it have to do with self-assessment? So it's just, it was more a question that I'm just posing. It's, it's an observation. My observation is this, when we think about our school environments, there is very little that students do that is private. There's very little time during the day when their failures aren't public, their successes aren't public, their, um, you know, everything that they do is, is out there. And, 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 and it's part of, I mean, it's, to be fair, it's, it's, we're constantly trying to look for evidence. So we have to ask kids to produce it, sure. kids, but in my, in my second book, Unlocked, about creativity, I, I reflect on the notion that when, when human beings are involved in creative processes or cri really deeply critical thinking, yeah. um, they, there's a moment for all of us, when you think of yourself as a creator, where you're not ready to share. Yeah. Sure. It's personal, it's private. So you're, so like when I write a book, I'm a weirdo, but I don't write a proposal with a chapter. I have to write the whole book. And, and I know I'm absurd that way, but for <laughs> me, I don't know what I'm going to end up with until I end up with it. And I'm not ready to share it until I'm comfortable with my message. And I think there's very little space for kids to have those feelings 
because sure. everything has to be public. So this is the question I pose in that last chapter is, is there a time and a place um, when we're using data notebooks and portfolios or self-assessment where students can just have five minutes to reflect on their work and their struggles and their strengths and not hand it in, share it with a partner. Right. Like it's their, it's their private thinking because I think it also lends um, strength to the idea that they hold agency. Yeah. And um, as long as they're accountable for every single moment of every single day, it's really tough to hand over agency. What makes us independent as adults is someone isn't checking up on us all the time. And so I think there's a time and a place to say, you know what, you're going to write a reflection today about how it went and you're going to keep it or you're going to write five reflections. And I, I would like to see one of them, but you can pick which one you're ready to share. And so I just think being cautious, it really relates to safety, sure. um, you know, that sort of notion of being okay and it really helps kids become more comfortable with the idea of failure if failure doesn't always have to be so public. Pivot to your book, because I was reading this and I, I was diving into it. Um, and one of the things that really you know fascinated me is, is this idea of mudras. And we'll talk about that in a few seconds, um, because mm -hmm. I, I really had never thought about it until you wrote the book. And when I was reading it, I was like, wow, you know, our hands are truly powerful. But can, can you actually kind of talk, actually transition from, you know, what we were just talking about in terms of the, the, the kids um, and, and, you know, they're, they're experiencing trauma. And so how does this book link to your work with survivors of trauma? Because, you know, child soldiers, um, the, the traffic girls, but other people um, have experienced trauma. And so how, do, how does this book link to this idea of survivors of trauma? Yes, um, you know, our body is, yes, one of the layers of our existence. And is the first layer, is the the grosser layer of our existence, right? Because it's what is tangible and, and, and what we can touch. And so it's also the gate into trauma. We, most of the times we experience trauma through our body. Um, and, you know, when we talk about trauma, people think about sexual abuse or physical abuse or domestic violence, but trauma, it can come from a car accident. It can come for the loss of, of someone that you love or for a long illness or, or for feeling betrayed by somebody who you love. And so those traumatic experiences are being um, experienced through the body first. That's where we feel. We feel that punch in the stomach or, or our heart. Yeah. You know, it's very somatic in our body, but we barely pay attention to that. And when you talk about healing trauma in general, the first response is to, okay, well, you should go to therapy or, you know, you should go and talk to somebody about it. But a lot of the time survivors of trauma, they don't want to talk about their trauma, um, but they want to feel better. So this, this book, came uh, I I practice mudras myself and I share with the kids that I work with um, you know I, I introduce them into meditation yoga um, different things that we use in, in the Vedic tradition and what what is important is that how we can release trauma from the body the body the the, the trauma is a is is also is, is a way of energy and so it gets stuck in our bodies and when we only cognitively understand trauma and when we only focus on the mind but we don't integrate the body into the healing process then it creates a lot of disassociation and so the idea is to be able to allow these energies to flow through the body and and be able to release uh, but of course, mudras is not only for trauma. Mudras um, is a practice that we use through meditation. We also use to improve our physical health. Right. Um, you know, like uh, problems with digestion, um, etc. So, what what are mudras uh, for for people who had never really you know kind of broached the subject? It was something that was very new to me. So, what are mudras? Yeah. So mudras is easiest. 
a specific hand gestures that we do, we use our fingers in, in our hands. And what it does, every finger is connected with an element um, in nature. And mudras is part of a Vedic tradition of Vedic teachings and um, the Vedic um, the Vedic knowledge is so vast. So you have different mm, branches, you know, you have Ayurveda, which is um, more of the medical branch of, uh, of the Vedic knowledge. You have yoga, um, you have Vedanta. So it's, a, it's many, many, um, you know, it's very vast. So, but mudras, it's a part that work specifically with certain energies. So in Ayurveda, we see everything is created by, well, I mean, not only in Ayurveda, in reality, everything is created by the elements. You have the ether, you have the element of air, the element of fire, water, and earth. And those elements are not only part of the universe in the world, but it's part of our body. You right. know, you think about your body, your body is uh, the majority of the part of your body is water, liquids, right. you know, fluids. Um, the physical part of your body that is made of element of earth is the earth is heavy. You know, our body is heavy and is solid. Um, think about element of air. What is in our nostrils? What is in the cavities in between our bones? So every element is part, all the elements are part of our body. So the fingers also hold the elements and represent each element. The thumb represent fire. Um, the the how you call the pointy finger the index finger this finger yeah <laughs> yeah the index finger that's yeah. right uh represent air uh the middle finger represent the space mm -hmm. the annular finger is linked to the element of earth and the little finger is um represents or is linked to the element of water so when we bring fingers together to do certain mudras, we are bringing these elements together so we can balance those elements in our body. So, so for instance, so before yeah. you go on, um, Esther, would you say that, there, that, that these elements are a source of pleasure or a source of happiness? Well, what happened is that when we have any kind of imbalance in our elements, mm -hmm it can contribute to illnesses because we are out of balance. Right. So the whole idea be beyond uh, Ayurveda and the mudras and any other tools that we learn is to bring our body, our mind and our soul into balance. Because only when we are in balance, we can live a healthy life. And so, if you have your element of air out of balance, for example, and the element of air is uh, related to our mind, our thoughts, but also our colon and certain parts of our digestive system, if it's an imbalance, then maybe you're going to feel a little bit constipated or you're going to feel bloated on your stomach right. or you're going to have fear or anxiety over thinking because you know it's too much going on here in your head sure. so we want to bring those elements back into a natural state of balance you know how do you see this book used possibly in schools and i'll get back to how families can use it but i wanted to segue to how do you think this book can be used in school so so i'll share with you one of the ways that we've used it already um at at, at my school um my, our literacy coach came to me and said hey mr mcdavid we are planning a literacy night and the theme for the whole week is going to be changing our world and so we're going to talk about different ways that we change our world and, and, and um, you know, different things that we can be in the future that help to change the world, you know? Yeah. And I said, uh, okay, excellent. And she said, I know you've talked to me about your book. Would you mind reading that as our opening activity for this literacy night that really kind of sets the tone for talking about all these different careers? And I think, um, you know, 
uh, especially in, in, in early elementary, right? You know, oftentimes first grade, you're talking about, you know, your community and you're right. talking about who are the different people in the community. Sure. Um, but I started thinking back, like, man, when I, when I think about um, all the different people that play a role in the community and the books that I grew up reading, they didn't have people that looked like me yeah. in those uniforms yeah. or playing those different roles. Yeah. And so I think one of the things that we can do in, uh, automatically is just remind people, right, that, that, um, that there are people that look like sure. you and I doing these jobs that are police officers, that are firefighters. And, and I got to be honest, the police officer piece, um, when I originally wrote this book, probably over, uh, um, you know, or originally thought of this idea, I should say, um, two or three years ago, the police conversation was already slightly different, but I think sure. it's real different now, right, in the midst of everything. Yeah. And, um, and I think a lot about, I thought a lot about that when I saw myself illustrated in, in a police uniform and I thought, wow, what a, what a difference it might make to maybe change some of that narrative and some of that yeah. conversation. Um, you know, I actually, uh, locally here serve on our, on our police review board. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so I've been working with our police chief who was a 30 year you know, state police officer prior to coming here uh, to lead the department, black man. And yeah. when he walks in in the uniform, I find myself, you know, as, as a 30 some year old being like, oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. I see you, brother. You know, yeah. and, and I think there's something to that. So, well, I think that's important. Again, representation matters and, and, and making sure that we have those conversations, those open, honest conversations. My, my cousin is a police chief. And he does a wonderful job with community policing and reaching out and doing so many things. And I think we sometimes forget that, that many of our family members are officers or police officers, but we see a narrative in the media that sometimes paints a, a different picture, which is not, I can't say it's untrue in some instances, but we right. have to really continue to make things better and make you know kids feel like, okay, um, this, this officer is somebody I should be able to relate to but we have to make sure that they understand the history. Right, right, 100%. Yeah, yeah so I, I think, you know, there's, there's, I think there's varying levels. Um, my, my hope too is, is just that it exposes students to the idea um, that they can be um, anything that they wanna be. Um, and again, I think that goes for all of our students, uh, particularly our students of color. I, I'll, I'll share with you just real quick. I had a situation uh, when I was probably a junior in high school. So we're talking 2000, 2005, um, that um, I was at, a, at an event in Harvey, Illinois, which is a uh, sub, south suburb of Chicago. Uh, I was at a, this church event and I was talking with these folk that were my age. And I said, you know, yeah, I'm thinking I'm going to go to school and become either a lawyer or a doctor. And um, this young black girl said to me, those are white people jobs. Yeah. And I just remember, like, I, I hold on to that today as a, as a principal, because um, I want to make sure that our kids are aware all jobs are their potential jobs. Exactly. You know, um, and again, my, my building currently is about 80% Latino. Um, and, um, and so I think about what I, what I kind of mean, what I represent when I step in there and read this sure. book to them sure. as well. So, I mean, I love, you know, when you said that it's, it's just so interesting because I'm much older than you are. Um, but when I was coming up, um, in, in the 60s and 70s, and again, my you know my parents talked to me about you know again our history, you know there is no job that we can't do and that we weren't doing right and so but there's this gap that happened where um, a lot of our kids have not seen themselves um, being able to do certain professions and I do have to be honest I went to Catholic school from you know first grade to eighth grade and I had a, a very fine experience. Um, I struggled early on to learn how to read, but my parents, you know, my dad was a principal, he was a reading teacher, and my, my mom and went to college and, and, and they all, they said, we got you. 
because I have to be honest back then, and I talked to my brother and sister, you know, about this from, you know, first grade to eighth grade. I can't remember ever seeing in my Catholic school any books with people of color. And it's again, it's not a knock on them. Not, you know, I'm not, you know, trying to slam them, but it's just if if my parents didn't fill that void and we have a lot, a lot of kids whose parents can't fill that void for a number of reasons, not because they don't want to. Then right. in terms of sharing with them that this is possible, these are, you know, again, you, you know, in my house, it was like it, the question wasn't, are you going to college? The question is where? Right. And so we have to help kids understand that the world is their oyster. And there are people who look like them who come that that do every kind of profession. And so what you're doing is just really setting that table and giving them an idea that yes this is possible yeah you you know i i, I think even the idea of being an author um yep. is is one that um I, I took a moment to think about because i um i remember uh, when i read this story to our students i i said you know i remember as a second grader doing a young authors you know um event and and writing this story and getting a chance to to just kind of go through that process of, of writing and then editing and you know illustrating and then we we um, laminated it and we bound it and, and we did some of those things um, so I think I, I want them to to see like because I'm somebody that they know now you know like I'm just I'm just Mr. McDavid yeah. but Mr. McDavid can write a book so Again, you can write a book, and and um, you know I look forward to um, them getting a chance to see you know the next next few that'll that'll you know kind of come forward. Can you talk a little bit about why it's so important for um, teachers to build relationships with students? All right, because you know what? To be honest with you, uh, when you are building relationships with students. Uh, they just have more reason to, to learn. They want to learn because they really appreciate that relationship that they have with you. Yeah. So when you have that relationship, even it not only benefits the students, of course it benefits the students, but it also benefits the teacher in so many ways. Like it cuts down on discipline problems. It helps you present the content in a way that students will want to learn it. Yeah. And what it does is it just is that rewarding feeling that you have as a teacher, as an educator, that you're really connecting with these students, finding out what's going on in their lives and building those meaningful relationships and making those connections with students. And, and would you say that, you know, relationships, especially positive student teacher relationships, and you said something about in terms of that feeling that you get, um, it, it really does stimulate kind of this, this, this emotion of, helping motivate kids because if, if 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 you have a positive relationship with a student and they like you they feel like they they're liked then they're going to want to do the, they're going to want to do anything for you yeah you're exactly right and then uh when you go a step beyond that what you find is that you're not only helping the student you're not only helping the student be a successful student at you know doing the classroom work and you know mastering the content but you're actually helping that student be successful in life yeah. They ain't looking up to you as a role model. And so it's easier to get through to them. And then they open up to you. They let you know what's going on inside their lives. And they really appreciate you for taking more of an interest in their personal life, as opposed to just making sure that they're a successful student. Mm -hmm. And so what the research says is when they interview students from an affluent background, they ask them, what kind of teacher do you need to be successful? All right resoundingly the student said we need a teacher who's going to push us to get ready for college and careers right however when they interview students from low socioeconomic class or you know middle class families they said what kind of teacher do you need in order to be successful overwhelmingly the students responded i need a teacher who i know cares about me yeah and so what the research says we have to combine both because we have to have high expectations for our students but that caring piece is so important you, you know, when I was uh, starting my career and I've been in education for for, you know, over 34 years, when I started my career, I would have, you know, 
the the older teachers would always you know kind of harken back to the olden days and they would say in my day the kids wouldn't disrespect me why aren't their parents teaching them this and so you know how do you you know help teachers stop tape taking um disrespect from students and insubordination from students personally okay well you know what 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 you have to realize i can use an analogy of a person like a bully all right what we all know about bullies is that bullies they have something that's insecure about themselves right so in order to hide their own insecurities they try to point out imperfections of other people and what that does is make them feel better about themselves or make them look better in the light of other people. All right. So um, challenging students, it's the same thing mm -hmm. where they have some insecurity about themselves. Right. All right. And so what they do is they may disrespect their teacher or, you know, get into conflicts with other students. But what it is, it's something that's inside of them that it's that inner turmoil that they have that haven't been worked out yet. And so when the student disrespects a teacher, you know, the teacher shouldn't take it personal, all right? Because it's not anything that the teacher is doing wrong unless the teacher, you know, really did humiliate the student or, you know, disrespect the student in some sort of way. But nine times out of 10, it's something that's internally that's going on with that student. So I like to share the Q-tip principle. And so the Q-tip principle is an acronym. And what it stands for is quit taking it personal. Because when you take it personal, yeah. you carry around that weight, you, add, you question yourself, you question your efficacy, and you do yourself a, a really disservice when you think that there's something wrong with you as opposed to thinking, hey, there's something wrong with that student. I'm not gonna take it personal. And what I'm going to do is I'm gonna help this student. Right. So when you don't take it personal, you're willing to help that student by giving them whatever social and emotional support they need, you know, having those conversations, building that student's self-esteem, building that student's self-worth, building that student's value. And yeah. then next thing you know, the, the disrespect will stop. Right. However, we won't do that unless we stop taking it personally. Yeah. And one of the things I, I heard you say, and I think it's really important, what I've realized over my last, you know, you know, 30 years as an educator is that, you know, when a student lacks academic skills, we as educators teach them those skills. When a student lacks social skills, emotional skills, behavioral skills, we tend to punish. And, and, and you know, those skills aren't intuitive kids have to be taught those skills and model those skills. You're absolutely right. And so just like a teacher comes into the classroom and they say, I'm a math teacher, I shouldn't have to teach respect. And they're all prepared to teach their math. Right. But if you know you have students with behavior issues and you want to increase the respect that's shown to you, then what you have to do is also go in there with a plan to teach those behaviors. Yeah. You have to actually put some thought into it and, 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 and teach it. And so the line treat others the golden rule, treat others how they want to be treated. All right, that works in a lot of cases. However, some of these students haven't been taught respect. Right. And so what we have to do as teachers and educators is move beyond the golden rule and take it up a notch to the platinum rule. Teach, and we have to treat students how they need to be treated. That's what the platinum rule says. Right. Teach other, treat others how they need to be treated so they can uh, progress and grow in that area. Absolutely. Teachers have to understand the importance of uh, promoting wellness within themselves, making themselves a priority and doing what it takes so they can be healthy because stressed out teachers make stressed out students. Yeah. However, healthy teachers promote healthy students. And that's what we want to see. How can teachers develop empathy? I mean, that's a word we hear a lot lately. I mean, how can they develop empathy and show empathy to students who are struggling either socially or emotionally or academically? You know what? You, you have to have empathy. Um, and sometimes, you know, it can be somewhat taxing. And I look at this through the lens of, like you said before, where we were going through the pandemic and we had so many uh, social unrest issues and things like that. Yeah. My little brother is a Chicago policeman. And he said after the George Floyd incident, how just the public at large was just disrespecting police. Right. And he, he'd had several instances of disrespect when he went on calls and things like that. It was like people lost respect for the police. And so he said, Don, how do you handle this? Like you did, you work in a, in a neighborhood where some of your parents can be disrespectful, be a little bit uncouth. How do you deal with it? Don't you just have that low tolerance for ignorance where you just want to, you know, keep it moving? And I'm like, well, I said, would you rather be the doctor or be a patient? And he's like, well, what you mean? What you talking about? Right. 
there, well, think about it. Would you be rather be the one with the problem or be the person that's helping the person with the problem? And one of my favorite cartoon uh, superheroes is Spider-Man. Okay. The reason why, not because his last name is Parker, you know, <laughs> Parker, you know could say yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but in that movie, they talk about how he who is uh, who has much, much is also required. Right. And so we have to be servant leaders in this aspect. And we have to understand what our students issues are, understand that they have problems and trauma informed education teaches us not to ask what's wrong with the student, but ask what happened to the student. Yeah. And once we ask what happens to them, then we coming from an approach where, wow, you know, we really want to help you. And that has, that's how you develop empathy for students is just understanding that as servant leaders, you know, as, as teachers, as administrators, we're in a position to help them. And so we should take advantage of the opportunity to help our students and, and have empathy for what, what happened to them or what they're going through. We want to thank our guests tonight, Tracy Hewlin, Ann Billy Lipset, Katie White, Esther Rodriguez Brown, Maurice McDavid, and Dr. Don Parker. On the next A Conversation with Brian, we have Tom Hirk. I am so excited to welcome Tom on April 6th. Tom has written over 21 books, and he is in the top 30 of educators on our planet, ranked by Global Gurus. Join me on April 6th for the next A Conversation with Brian, where I get to chat with Tom Herrick.